The Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Chanticleer columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. And with me today, as always, is my fellow Chanticleer columnist, the man whose price and yield is always rising, it's Anthony McDonald. How are you, Anthony? <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, pushing fresh all-time highs here, James. Fantastic. Well, today we look at why surging bond yields have markets in a panic. We reveal what a new valuation of the Sydney Opera House says about figuring out how much stuff is worth. And we look ahead to the next data point that investors are sweating on. But first, James, a big uh, congratulations are in order for your big win last week with Collingwood winning the AFL Grand Final. What was it like at the MCG? Uh, it was uh, absolutely terrifying, Anthony, but at the end, it was all worth it. Terrific win by the Pies and to see my kids, my three sons and my mum shortly after the game at the MCG was uh, very, very memorable. So, And I, I did predict uh, that a Collingwood victory would be a boost to the economy and I, my early evidence is right. I saw... Uh, Lots and lots of spending on caps and all sorts of memorabilia, uh, as well as plenty of beers uh, during and after the game. So, uh, look, it was a great day, and um, I promise not to talk about Collingwood until next season. <laughs> James, tell us about Collingwood's coach, Craig McRae. I mean, he's compared to Ted Lasso. and Is it true? Oh, look, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm a bit wary of uh, reading too much into it. But, look, I think the main thing is... He doesn't take himself overly seriously. His wife had their third baby at 7.45 on the morning of the game. And if you get wow. a chance, there's some great footage of when he tells the team during uh, the pre-match address that he's had this had this kid. And they go absolutely bananas. It's a great example of like, you could imagine how tense and serious a moment mm. like that would be. And then you just totally change the perspective and you start to perform in what he says is a place of joy. So without further ado, Anthony, let's perform this Chanticleer podcast in a place of joy too and get on to some more weighty matters. Anthony, we've got some really interesting figures this week about the state of the mortgage market, which surprisingly to me at least showed Australia's biggest bank, Commonwealth Bank, is going backwards in the mortgage market for a second straight month. What's what's going on here? This is very un-CBA-like. Very. I mean, there's a fascinating tussle going on between the banks. I and mean, this time last year and into the first half of 2023, you'll remember there was the mortgages war, right? Like all the banks yep. were offering these cashbacks and, uh, you know, ch cheaper, cheaper rates, writing loans below their cost of capital. And it was really competitive. And then some of the heat came out of the market in May and it was CBA that sort of took some of the heat out of the market. They really stepped back and sort of let the other banks, um, you know, compete amongst themselves. But it also gave permission for others to sort of step out. Anyway, competition sort of fired up again, but CBA is not part of it. Mm. So for the second month in a row, CBA's loan book has shrunk. And that's rare, you know. CBA is yeah. normally out, out in front. It's the one that's normally leading the growth. It's, you know, it's the biggest bank. It's arguably the best run bank. But for two months in a row, it's loan book shrunk. Yes. So it has to decide now whether it wants to play in mortgages and re and relead the pricing and get back in the game. Or if it's happy just to sit out for a bit longer and, and let everyone else write more loans. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be really fascinating to see what happens. We should say, Anthony, that... The, the byproduct of not competing so hard for CBA is probably that the profitability of their mortgage book has gone up because they're not mm. offering these cashbacks. They're not competing as hard. So in one way, the, 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 there's, a, there's a happy byproduct to this. But the danger, right, is that if you stay out of the market too long and your market share erodes a little bit more, that can, that can be hard to win that back over the long term. So James, it's a bit like uh, going into an auction and buying a house. Like, how, how many times are you willing to get outbid before you then just decide to go in and and uh, you know up up your uh, price and go harder? Yes. And that that's kind of what CBA has to decide to do. Does it want to keep missing out, or does it want to get back in on the action? And we should say that the, the falls in the size of their mortgage book are pretty small, but it is interesting that nobody's missed it. Every banking analyst, uh, our our own James Ayres, yourself. Everybody's watching. It's a different. 
I don't know. I reckon CBA is used to being the hunter in a way, throwing its weight yeah. around, and now it's the hunted a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, James, let's move to our first big topic of the week, and that's yet another surge in bond yields that has set off something that has felt just a little bit like panic in Australia and globally. I mean, it's the reason why we're seeing a lot of red on our screens, why there's fresh talk of doom and gloom for the global economy, and it's really dominating headlines. Now, James, you're our, our bond yields uh, watcher here <laughs> on the on the Chanticleer team. We know bond yields can be hard going, and they're, but they're very important. So let's go through this bit by bit. First... How have bond yields moved this week? Well, they've moved up is the uh, uh, is is the short answer. We talked last week about bond yields hitting uh, the highest points since two thousand and seven, and that has continued this week. So we saw the ten year U.S. bond yield, which is really the benchmark um, price of capital around the world, that hit four point eight percent this week, uh, and then the thirty year uh, yield which is a long, a more long-term measure of the cost of capital. It hit 4.9%. I think what's worth remembering here, Anthony, is that bond yields tend to move quite slowly, gradually mm-hmm. over the course of many years. But what we've seen here is since the start of September, the 10-year bond yield in the US has jumped from 4.1% to 4.8%. That is very unusual. And it's that rapid repricing that's got everybody scrambling to adjust. It's it's a similar story in Australia, that the Australian 10-year bond yield's gone from 4% at the start of September to 4.6%. So as we said last week, that has a cascading effect throughout markets. The bond yield sets the cost of capital and then everything gets repriced off that. So eventually the banks will reprice their loans uh, and their term deposits. Uh, investors will start to reprice the shares of equities. And and that's what we've seen start to happen this week. Okay, so bond yields have gone into the sort of high 4% range. What does that actually tell us about the economy? It tells us that investors are now betting that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer. And there's lots of reasons for that. Investors think inflation is going to stay sticky for longer than the central banks would like. They think there's going to be lots and lots of debt issued by governments, particularly the US government, um, to help pay for everything that a government needs to do. Once you increase the supply of debt, you have to lift the yield that you're offering to uh, lenders to uh, you know, get them over the line. And I guess the other thing is it says that investors are seeing more risk in the world. When you see more risk in the world, you want to be uh, you, you want to be rewarded for that, and you get rewarded through that through a higher bond yield. So it says the world's becoming a, a more uncomfortable place, is the way I'd put it. So bond yields are rising, the world's becoming more uncomfortable. And then and then what are the flow-on effects? Well, the flow-on effects, the first one is is share prices. So uh, bond yields are used to discount the value of a, of a company's future profits. So when a bond yield's higher, the discount needs to be bigger, and the share prices fall. The other big thing here is in currency markets. So a a higher bond yield in the US means people want to buy those bonds. They want to buy US dollars to buy those bonds. So the US dollar is strengthening. We saw the US dollar strengthen against the Australian dollar and really against basically every currency in the world, particularly emerging market currencies this week. So why is that bad? Well, it makes it harder for Australia to keep inflation down because all of our imports have now become more expensive. So we run the risk of importing inflation. So there's a few of the flow on effects. You see it in the cost of capital, you see it in, in share markets, and you see it in currency markets. That's a, a couple of the flow on. That, that's why this matters. And uh, uh, the other big news out of the US is connected to this. So obviously, the big news was the removal of the Speaker of the House of Congress, Kevin McCarthy. Anthony, how do you how do you connect that sort of circus in US House of Congress with what's happening in bond yields? Yeah, it looks like a real circus, doesn't it? <laughs> Sitting over yeah, here absolutely. on the other side of the world. <laughs> um, but I guess it just sets off this bout of political uncertainty, and that puts things like credit rating downgrades potentially on the agenda makes US debt more risky, makes bonds worth less, which sends the yields up and bonds go down. I mean, how much of it all? It's kind of hard to quantify, but it's just another force at play, I guess, in the market at a time when people are looking for forces. And it's all a game of liquidity and where the sort of, where the big money's flowing at the moment. Um, You know, the market, 
I feel like the market sort of always moves the way it wants to. And then we sort of scratch around looking for, for reasons why, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's just, it's the big, the big investors where they want to put their money. That's, that determines, you know, what happens with bond yields and, and, uh, equities and whatnot. But I think it's, I think it's to do, so going back to the speaker, I mean, it's all just about that, um, uncertainty, right. Yep. And as that risk. As uncertainty uh, rises, people are going to demand more uh, for their money. But and then the worry with the higher bond yields, James, is eventually they might break something, right? And that, I think that's kind of what we spoke about last week. Last time they were up here was was just before the financial crisis. It was similar in 1987 before the crash. Do you reckon there's anything like that in the foreseeable future? Well, look, I mean, this is the big risk. Everyone's wondering what's going to break. Um, And and I don't think we've seen anything really get close to breaking recently. I mean, we did have an episode of this, though, back in March. Bond yield spiked in March and uh, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed and and took a few other US banks with it. So we, we recovered pretty quickly from that. But that's an example of how things can break. Now... If a big bond fund was uh, hit by sudden losses, that might trigger something. If we saw uh, banks start to get nervous about other banks' exposures and get nervous about lending to each other, that's where you might get a a, a break. Um, I wonder about you know the, the the big difference, Anthony, between two thousand and eight, so the GFC, and two thousand and twenty three now is all these private assets. You know, the world is up Mm. to its eyeballs in venture capital, private equity, private credit. And all of it's all of it's sort of hidden from from public view, obviously. What if there's some gremlins in there? So I think those are the types of things that people uh, are starting to think about. Where are the nasties at the, the the thing about this though, Anthony, is you never you never know till you know, right? No, nobody absolutely nobody really saw the subprime crash unwinding like it did, or else they would have done something about it. I mean, that's the nature of these black swans. So, you know, my 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 five guesses there are probably all wrong, and it'll be something else if and when it does happen. <laughs> but but Anthony, let's bring all this back to to home base here. We saw the new governor of the Reserve Bank, Michelle Bullock. Uh, announced her first rates decision this week. What will she have been making about this lift in bond yields and how will that feed into the RBA's thinking? Yeah, like amid, amid all the chaos, and it feels like it has been a bit chaotic this week in markets. Yeah, Michelle Bullock had to oversee her first meeting as governor and it was rates on hold as we expected. The RBA would be watching this very closely. I mean, financial market turmoil has potentially big impacts on Australia, on the economy. Yeah, Just sort of our, our place in the global market. We can't we, we, we are an island here, but we're highly connected <laughs> yeah. in terms of the financial markets. In saying all that, it didn't get that much of a mention in the RBA statement that supported its decision on Tuesday. It'd be interesting to see if there's more in the um, minutes of the meeting when they come out. But I mean, the statement from the RBA board, which was nearly word for word from the statement, mm. the last statement we saw from the prior meeting under um, Philip Lowe, it only really mentioned... Well, it didn't mention anything specific about bond yields. I mean, it, it no, sort of spoke no. about a few things in the domestic economy, like rents and petrol prices on the local front, but it didn't really address the bond yields. Now, I'm not sure if that's because these statements are pre-prepared and the bond yield stuff snuck up, the, up on them a bit or what, but it, it it didn't actually say that much, did it, James? No, no. I mean, I guess my, my, my question as I reflect back on it you know, a few days later is, did... Did Bullock sort of miss an opportunity here? We've seen the Federal Reserve, and there's tons of Federal Reserve officials speaking every week, but the message has been pretty consistent. We're still worried about inflation. Don't think we're going to cut rates soon. We might not have to lift them, but we're not cutting rates. I mean, one of the Fed speakers said, we are not cutting rates for a long time. But the message from Bullock was... You know, I, I think she was keen to do the continuity thing and keep the statement the same and show solidarity with Philip Lowe. But I wonder if she missed a chance to say, hey, no, inflation is still a worry. I mean, rents are rising at 20% a year. Oil prices are up. This is not mm-hmm. okay. In, instead, it was, oh, well, you know, we're pretty comfortable with this idea that we'll get back to the target rate of inflation by the end of 2025. Now, 
I struggle to think about the end of next week sometimes, Anthony, but thinking about <laughs> the end of 2025 is not easy. Yeah, I hear. So, so uh, at the end of that, <laughs> where do you think local rates go from here? Where, 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 do, where does the RBA take rates? The market's pretty split about whether there's another rate rise left this year. I mean, I still think that it, it could happen. There was more pretty strong data out, out on uh, Thursday this week about the consumers actually going okay. Yeah, so yeah. I think with the cost pressures we've just spoken about, with the wage rises, it feels like there's still a bit of heat out there. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, I mean, I, I still think it, it could be coming. Yeah. And, and what do you, where do you think the share market goes next? I mean, I, I know the answer to that is, well, if I knew, I wouldn't be doing this podcast with you, James. <laughs> but um, yeah. but we, we've seen, like, there's some interesting carnage out there. You've been keeping track of some of the big lows of late. Take us through a few of them. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Like, we, we know a few things. One's that investors love bargains, right? They love cheap stocks. Yes. The other thing we know is a lot of them are sitting on cash at the moment. Yeah. They're just, they've taken money out of the market and they're just sitting there and waiting. So they've got all this money and there's all these cheap stocks out there, but they're not buying them. There's a bit of a buyer's strike sort of going on. Mm. So as, as a result, we're seeing a lot of these cheap companies that are, that are trading at all time lows and they just seem to tick lower each day, just getting lower and lower. So things like, things you think might normally be pretty defensive, like Australian Clinical Labs or Helios, right? They're pathology groups. Yep. Um, you know, one of those is an all-time low. The other one's at a 10-year low, I think. Um, you got things like Fund Manager Platinum, the Casino Group Star, which has other problems. You've got Perpetual, Lendlease, Cromwell, Iris, you know, all at 10-year lows or more. And then you've got all these other companies at three-year lows and five-year lows, you know, Elders, GBT Group, Centre, Seven West Media. There's heaps of them. Yeah, like, yeah. The, the dogs of the ASX are really getting pounded <laughs> at the moment. It's understandable though, isn't it, Anthony? I mean, uh, you, you buying a stock, buying into a company is is a risky thing to do. By comparison, you can get over 5% out of cash. Like it's a no-brainer, isn't it? I mean, it's not so much a, bri- a buyer's strike, but just common sense. Yeah, well, I wouldn't buy most of these things with your money, James, <laughs> to be honest. Like a lot of them, are, a lot of them have got uh, prickles on them. It's just that normally though, like, the fund managers love a bargain. Yeah, yeah. Well, and maybe there are bargains they, out there. Yeah, maybe they just need a little bit more certainty around rates and all this mess before they'll open the wallets and go bargain hunting. Well, Anthony, let's move to our second topic of the week. And this week, you wrote a fascinating piece about an exercise to value what you quite justifiably called the most famous human-built thing in Australia. The Sydney Opera House. Now, valuing the Sydney Opera House is a, it's an incredible exercise, really, and it goes to a big question. How do we actually value stuff, and particularly the stuff that's invaluable? Now, when it comes to ca- companies, Anthony, there's a pretty simple formula. We figure out what a company's revenue is, then we figure out what sort of profit margin it operates on, and then we can apply what's called a price earnings multiple to that profit. So how much are you willing to pay for those earnings? And that gets you to a valuation. Now, it's easy to do this with companies listed on the share market because, of course, they're all obligated to share all their information with shareholders. But it's harder for companies that aren't listed or, or for private companies. A good example this week, Anthony, was the tech giant Canva, which you wrote about as well. It's, it's a private company. So can we use that little model I outlined there to, to get to a vo- towards a valuation of Canva? Oh, absolutely, we can. And we should. You know, there's no reason why. Just because it's private, there's no reason it shouldn't be valued like a proper company. Mm. And I think, I think actually this week, it, it put out some numbers on its revenue. It said it had US $1.7 billion revenue. Now, that number was a bit rubbery. It was kind of if you take what's happened in the past three months, times it by four to get a 12-month figure, you'd get to US $1.7 billion. Yep. You know, that, that's a bit of an iffy way to do it. But anyway, if, if you put that to one side, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take that revenue number. Look at similar companies that are growing at the same sort of rate. So it's growing at about 21% a year based on that quarterly extrapolated performance. Um, There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take the revenue number. So look at its roughly size, look at how quickly it's growing, and then compare it to other things in the market and see what it's worth. Yeah, yeah. Now, so so I I did that. So so the biggest thing in tech stocks in Australia is WiseTech. Now, WiseTech's about 
half the size of Canva in terms of its revenue, but it's actually growing a little bit quicker. It's growing at sort of 30% a year. So it's trading at about 20 times its revenue. So you'd say, okay, well, Canva's worth a bit less than that. If Wisetech's at 20, perhaps Canva's worth 15 times. Yep. And that sort of checks out, if you compare it to stuff in the US, a bunch of similar companies that are also growing at um, 20%, like NASDAQ listed stuff, they're sort of trading in that 10 to 20 times revenue as well. So just as a rough guide, I mean, you could sort of take, say, Canva, take its revenue, US 1.7 billion, times it by, say, 15 times, and you get about $25.5 billion US, yeah, which is okay. a big number. But it also happens to be the number that it uh, most recently got valued at in a, um, in a sell down that happened in August. So, I mean, I, I kind of got a little bit comf- of comfort out of this whole camp evaluation yeah. out of yeah. that, to be yeah. honest. You know, like we, um, it's something that we've all been looking at and wondering about for a while. Yes, absolutely. It kind of makes sense. Yeah. So that, that's exactly, it does make sense. Uh, so mm. investors do this with companies every yeah. day. Uh, that, that, yep. uh, we get that. Yep. But how on earth do you value something like the Sydney Opera House? Yeah, good question. I mean, so Opera House, um, Deloitte did it and, and they did a few things that were quite interesting. Basically, they looked at how much people spend at the Opera House and how much they're likely to spend over the next 50 years and then, and then discounted that back. They also looked at um, how much they spent, but then how, looked at how much they would have spent for the exact same thing and added that in. They looked at um, how much people in Australia think it's it's worth just having it, right. like an existence value, right? So it's like you and I sit here, neither of us going to the Opry House today, but we're like, all right, it's just great to have it. We want to own it. This is what we think the government should should spend on it on our yep. behalf. Yep. And then it looked at things like the digital rights. So, I mean, Deloitte did it all up. They came, came up with an $11.4 billion social value, which if you, that, if you add that to the sort of the land and the building value, you get close to $15 billion. Now, it's a lot of money, $15 billion. Yeah, but yeah. what do you reckon, James? Are you buying or selling the Opera House for 15 bill? Oh, it's a tough question, isn't it? Mm. Look, I'm buying because that is prime waterfront land, and I know what that's worth in Sydney. So I'm buying, I'm knocking the place down, and we're going to put up so many apartments <laughs> that you will not be, you, you will not be able to move uh, without walking into a, another one of our buildings. But look, I, I, I'm mucking around a bit here, Anthony. How do you, I mean, you're a Sydney sider. How do you think about the social value of this place? In some ways, this exercise points out just how priceless this asset is, doesn't it? A hundred percent. I mean, the social value is huge. I mean, we've, over the years, I've been to plenty of shows, the Opera House, you know, Carl Barron, the comedian, or uh, saw Paul Kelly, the musician at the Opera House. But I tell you what, I wouldn't mind to see a water slide just come off the top of it into the Sydney Harbour off the top of your apartment building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the reason the reason why we're so interested in Canva's revenue number this week and its valuation is, I mean, this thing's going to line up for an, in, in, an initial public offering. It's going to float at some stage. Yeah. Buckley's chance it floats in Australia, it's going to be over in the US, you'd think, just given the deeper sort of uh, capital markets over there, the bigger pool of investors. And that's why we're so interested in its valuation because one day, likely soon, you know, I'm not talking tomorrow, but in the next, you know, 12 months, two years, it's actually, you know, after us talking about Canva for years and years and what it's worth, us grilling the superannuation funds who own mm, it for the value, mm. for how they value it on their books, rubber's going to hit the road and, uh, you know, Canva's actually going to be cap in hand in front of uh, listed markets with a proper valuation out there. And it's going to be fascinating to see how much it is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Will it be one opera house or two, I guess is the question to ask. (laughs) Anthony, we'll come back after the break and look at the big bit of data that will have markets on edge heading into the weekend. Well, welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Friday, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them straight to your inbox. Now, Anthony, uh, I'm Sydney bound, coming to see you next week for our Energy Summit on Monday and Tuesday. Uh... 
this will be fascinating because the energy transition is not in a happy place and it'll be interesting to see how the big players in industry and government can get it back on track. Yeah, it's a two-day agenda they've put together. And I don't know if you've looked at it closely, but it is jam-packed. There are so many um, so many keynote addresses, particularly on that first day. I don't think I've seen one like it. It is just, it is just back to back to back. Yep. And um, from what I hear, panelists are still trying to get in. Um, we had one trying to get on uh, one of my panels just this week. So, yeah, no, it, sh- it, should, be, it should be a great time. I and mean, this is a red-hot issue. It's so important. It's, it's so current. Um, perfect time to have the summit. And a hell of a lot of money at stake too. Um, on Wednesday, we get Bank of Queensland's results. I'm talking to Patrick Alloway. First thing, uh, in some ways, we talked about the mortgage market, but in some ways it's about what costs uh, Bank of Queensland's managed to extract from its business that's going to be important here. Yeah, Bank of Queensland, poor old Bank of Queensland's had a shocker. Mate, it's one of those dogs that's in the uh, investor sin bin. The numbers aren't going to be pretty. I mean, I think we can be sure of that. Yep. There's been write downs and impairments um, yes. ahead of the result. Um, poor old Patrick Alloway, the chairman who who uh, now finds himself chief executive officer, he's got to somehow try and find a way to turn this thing around. Yeah, and sell a, a sell a message of hope to investors on Wednesday too. Um, but I think the the thing to watch out for is. Friday night, uh, Saturday morning, into Saturday morning our time, and that's the U.S. jobs data. So U.S. non-farm payrolls, they're called, basically a fancy Mm -hmm. name for their employment data. Uh, If employment comes in stronger than the market anticipates, we could have bond yields surging again uh, and some real carnage on markets. Um, if we get a benign print, if, if it looks like the employment market is starting to soften, then we might get the opposite, a really big sigh of relief and a bit of a rally. So this is one to watch, Anthony. Yeah. So you're cheering on the uh, hot job so we can keep talking about bond yields for a few more weeks? Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm always barracking for the story here, Chanticleer. <laughs> Well, Anthony, we love getting questions from our readers, and uh, this week's question comes from Tim from Sydney. And if you've got a question you want to send in, email us at chanticleer at afr.com. You could also send in an audio question if you want. Just record a voice memo on your phone, include your name and where you're from, and email it to us at that same address. And Tim asks, as someone nearing 30 years old, superannuation is understandably not a... in front of mind for me, or likely anyone around my age. That said, I'm earning decent income, 150000 and I feel like I need to take it more seriously and consider the potential compounding ahead of me. I currently have my super sitting in a CBA essential product, the old Colonial First State Mob, I believe. Seems to be a safe option, but are there any metrics I should specifically be looking at for my age? A few friends have told me I need to look at moving to an industry fund like Host Plus. Honestly, when I do my research online, they all sound and look the same. Any pointers or advice from the experts? Uh, Thanks, Tim. Look, I don't think, uh, Anthony, we're going to get into the recommendation of or or, uh, dismissal of any named super funds. Mm -hmm. But I think what Tim needs to be thinking here is not so much about which super fund, but what option within that super fund he should be thinking. So he's 30 years old, being in a defensive option that's mainly cash or uh, you know mainly fixed income, that's not where you want to be, Tim. You've got, what, 40 years of saving ahead of you. So you want to be in the high growth options or at least consider those high growth options. Um, and, and you can talk to your super fund about that uh, and and see what options they've got for a bright young spark like you who's doing well. I, I guess the other thing, Anthony, is you might be able to make um, extra contributions into your super at your age, which have some tax benefits. Talk to an accountant or financial advisor about that. Anything I've missed, Anthony? Well, the tax office has a really good your super comparison tool. If you just if you just um, like Google your super ATO, you'll find it, and you can actually do a personalised version. And it'll show you the fee structure and sort of eight-year net return of all the funds. Now, I actually did it this afternoon. Oh, I compared okay. my fund to Tim's fund. And uh, and I'm in an industry fund, and I thought my fees would be really low. But it turns out, t- Tim, if I was in Tim's fund, I'd be saving about 1000 bucks a year <laughs> in fees. <laughs> but but the returns the returns were quite much stronger on my fund. Right. But um, anyway, it's a really eye-opening exercise, but the, it's 
yeah, it's it's tax office data. So I mean, these funds are really good at marketing their their returns and all that sort of stuff. But I think if you go through this through the tax office tool, you should be getting um, good, solid, independent data. But it's it's really easy to compare. So Tim, if you can use the internet and you know, as thirty year old with a hundred fifty thousand dollar a year job, you should hopefully you should be able to get get on that on that um, tool, the your super comparison tool. And you can compare your fund to, you know, 50 other funds and you'll pretty quickly see how you're doing based on returns and fees. Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of good calculators and tools out there, which makes this uh, much more, much easier than it was a few years ago. But hey, Tim, good on you for thinking about it at age 30. You're right. Not everyone is. And the more people who do, the better the retirement they will have. Well, Anthony, uh, another busy week. I look forward to joining you up in Sydney for a jam-packed energy summit. Yeah, let's go check out the Opera House together. Fantastic. See you next week. If you like the podcast and you want to hear more, consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. For more, go to afr.com and you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at afr.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson and Anthony McDonald and it was produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.